Um, I'd like to do three things in this session. I want to go back to, remember after we had those slides, Greg, slide number seven, please. After I put those slides about what, what these female pop stars say about culture, and I sort of summarized what I think it's saying. So what I want to do is go back and then say, okay, having done all that stuff in scripture, what might, how might we respond to those, those things that... Um, get in there, Greg. How, how then do we respond to those things? So if you can get the whole slide up rather than just one at a time. Um, so, that we, so that we're actually doing that thing. We're, we're doing the hermeneutics and in interpreting our culture. We're doing the hermeneutics and interpreting scripture and then we're making them connect. So that's the key thing we need to do. Um, Anthony Thistleton, who is, uh, lives around the corner for me, is sort of a big name in this whole area of hermeneutics. He says, look, the, the task of hermeneutics is fusing the two horizons. We've got the horizon of the text on the one hand and we've got the horizon of us as readers in a, in a different world on the other. So... So biblical interpretation is about bringing those two horizons together and seeing how they engage. So here are the, here are the one, two, three, four, five, six things. Now, that's primarily about fluidity of sexuality. If we want to, if we want to look at the trans issue particularly, I'd add a seventh, which is that the plastic body should be shaped to fit the sexed soul, the interior life. Okay, so it's an extra step from that. But essentially, we've got the primacy of, primacy of fluidity and choice. Um, and um, what does what we've learned say about that? It says, well, actually, uh, the, the, the individual isn't king. We're not kings of our own castle. We're actually interconnected. We're, we're body, soul, unities in community. That's the vision that God has, has given us. God makes humanity, male and female, together in community, working together to be fruitful, multiply to, uh, and, and to exercise his dominion. Uh, choice is not king. Choice gives us stress. Um, now, in response to that, some people will react and go back to a kind of the moralism of the 1950s where there's zero choice. <laughs> and scripture seems to us to say, uh, it's not about being prescriptive and saying there's no choice, but neither is it saying choice is the champion. So. We are moral agents working within a community and working within uh, the kind of norms that, that God gives us. Consent as the irreducible minimum. So what that says is that our wills are free and autonomous and are, are determine what we, what we do. And what scripture says to us is no, actually, because our, our wills have been distorted. Um, Luther summarized the, uh, the problem of human sin. He said it was the core curvum in se, the heart turned in on itself. Uh, our wills, our decision have been corrupted by sin, by selfishness, well, by things from within where we choose the wrong things, we choose things that harm us, but also from other people imposing their will on us. So we are both sinned and sinned against. So the gospel says that we can't simply look to our, our own will and our own consent as if that's the um, the solution to our problems. And uh, I meant to take a picture. I was in a, uh, a college of higher education last weekend doing some teaching, and they had a, some screens up, a series, of, a series of screens coming up. And, and one of them was about sexual behavior. And it said, no means no at any moment. So it was arguing about, in, in, in a sense, the goal was a good one, because it was saying that you can't, continue in sexual activity with someone without their consent. But the, the, the problem was, it was saying that, A, people are, uh, can give their consent or withdraw their consent, uh, and they can do that at any time. Now, <laughs> I remember being a teenager. <laughs> I remember being a student. I, let me tell you that when you start engaging in sexual intimate activity with another person, the idea that your consent can be withdrawn and the, the, the thing can be stopped at any time is, well, can I put it this way? It's optimistic. Because that is not how sexual relationships function. And a Christian alternative to say, no, actually, it's not about the exercise of the will moment to moment which matters. It's actually creating a context and a framework, a safe framework, within which good sexual intimacy can, uh, can take place. And maybe we need to use the word good a bit more. I think, again, in response to what um, uh, Elaine was saying, we, we can't simply call God Father. Because as she says, people have all sorts of different experiences of Father. We do need to say, the biblical witness is, God is a good Father. We can't just say, boldly, sex is a good gift from God because sex, people experience sex in all sorts of damaging ways. But, but 
it's, it's potentially a good gift in the right context, used, deployed in the right way. Third point, plasticity of personal identity, nothing is given. Well, what we're, in the end, what we're doing there is we're saying we are not creatures. The fundamental truth of the biblical narrative is that we are created, we're created bodily, male and female. This is God's good gift to us. I remember that we, we were in um, church in Poole for 10 years, and on, I think it was near the, one of the last Sundays I was, I was preaching, it, and one of the things I felt I needed to say uh, is that if God is our creator then who we are is God's gift to us. And someone who heard that has been kept kept asking me for the last 20 years and said, I'm still trying to get my head around that. Who we are is God's gift to us. Now, who we are can be damaged and distorted. But God has given us personalities. God has given us a bodily form. God has made us tall or short. God has made us male or female. And... If God is our creator, if God is our good father, then recognizing that means coming to the point of recognizing that who I am is God's good gift to me. Now, let me be honest. There are things about myself I do not like. My nose is quite big. (laughs) I wish I was a bit thinner. I can do something about that. I... I recognize in myself a tendency towards... Conflict to asking questions, to challenging. Sometimes people don't like that. Within the Church of England, I don't actually fit very well. I'm too uppity. I said some, I made some comment in Archbishop's Council to a bishop, and I said something like, I've got another three questions to ask about this. And they said, yeah, well, there's a surprise. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> do you know, if I was a different personality, sometimes my life would go a lot smoother and the question I've got to ask is, do I need to rub off some, some sharp edges of mine because I'm actually not full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? Or, or is, 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 are people around me, is my culture telling me that actually the personality and the gifts that God has given me are a mistake and they need to change? So it's not a straightforward process, but in the trans issue, the particular question is, can we accept our sexed bodies as a good gift from God? with their limitations and constraints as well as the things which we enjoy about them. So for men, is, uh, is, it, is it okay for men to enjoy being strong, doing exercise, being a bit competitive? You know, is, is that okay? Is that all right? Is it okay not conforming to some of those masculine stereotypes? Can we, in, can we enjoy what's good about being men? Um, I think that in the, the, gen, the part of our media narrative is that all the problems in the world are from, come from men. And I think for some men, they, they, they find it difficult to enjoy the masculinity that they, they feel comfortable with. For others, they feel as though they have to live up to some damaging narratives about what masculinity is. And I think that varies quite a lot depending on where you are, particularly class-wise, actually. Um, can we value women as, as bodily female women? Can women do that without having all the pressures of our culture around conformity to certain stereotypes and expectations? Um, radical individual autonomy, I've already talked about that, so we're actually created psychosomatic unities, body-soul unities in community. Um, and part of saying that Jesus is our Lord is saying that I give myself over to someone who loves me, who calls me, and who invites me into a disciplined pattern of life, which is good for me. It's not coercive, it's not controlling, but it is a discipline. The interiorization of personal validity. And again, this is, I think we're suffering massively from this, that actually if we are cre- created psychosomatic unities, it means that who we are isn't simply a function of how we feel and how we view ourselves internally. We have an external reality, we have a communal reality, we find our place in community, and in, in particular we find ourselves, we find our identity in God's call on our life rather than in a sense of our interior construction of ourself. And if our 
bodies, if our bodiliness is a good gift from God, it means that we can't either say that our bodies are irrelevant. So biology might not be determinative of our destiny, but our bodily selves, Scripture tells us, are a good gift from God and therefore are not plastic and not to be distorted or changed in the light of our own interior feelings. So I think those are, those are kind of my drawing together the responses to partic the particular situation we're in. But I just want to add two sets of um, reflections to that with some spe specific examples from Scripture, which means that can we go to slide 26? Greg, I'm keeping him on his toes there. Because I think there's some really interesting specific issues that, that, that come out. Um, we might need to go to our Bibles as well. Some of this is on the slide, some of this not. First line cultures always tend towards patriarchy. Is that okay? Have you got it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, here we go. Well done, Greg. We'll give him a round of applause at the end, won't we? Press play. Yay! Okay, so first line on that. Cultures, well, Elaine and I entirely agreed. Cultures always tend toward patriarchy. Why is that? It seems to me that what's in the connection between sexed bodies on the one hand and a sexed society on the other? And it feels to me that so the connection is power. So cultures which recognize their sexed bodies on the one hand, if you then draw a straight line from the body to the organization of society, you do that by the imposition of power dynamics. And I think, again, Elaine started that yesterday by talking about some of, one of the big issues around the trans question is about who has power, who has influence, who has the money, who does the research. And we therefore, the reason why we, can't, the reason why we can say God gives us sex bodies, but God does not necessarily order societally along sex-delineated sex roles, is because of what Jesus says about power. So in Mark chapter 10, they're going along the road, and even though Jesus has said, I am the Son of Man, I'm the one who's going to be enthroned, I am the anointed one, I am the Christ, well, in the confession, chapter 8, where he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, in Matthew's verse he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the one who was to, who was to come to kick out the Romans to cleanse the temple, to renew and restore the people of Israel, to raise the dead, and to establish the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God over his people, so they will live in freedom and holiness all the days of their lives. That's the expectation we find in uh, Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, the Benedictus, which I'm sure you good Anglicans here say every day as part of morning prayer. It's a good, good text to say daily. All those are expectations of the exercise of power. So power to kick out the Romans, power to raise the dead, power to heal people. Luke's Gospel, um, some of us follow the lectionary, the set readings, and this year we're about to go through Luke's Gospel. Luke is really interested in the theme of power. When you look at parallel passages between Luke and the other Gospels, he often adds the word power. Jesus goes into the desert with, full of the Holy Spirit. When he's tested, he comes out full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He, does, he heals people with power. He gives, when he sends out the, seven, the, the, the 12 and the 72, he sends them out with power and authority. Power is a bit of a toxic term, but we've got to get our heads around the power that Jesus has, the power he gives us, and how we use power. So he says to Peter, the moment Peter says, you are this amazing, powerful one who's going to exercise power over Israel against our enemies, against the forces of death, raising people to life, Jesus immediately says... And this Son of Man will be handed over and will be crucified and will be raised on the third day. And in Matthew's Gospel, Peter takes him aside and says, you know, or in all the Gospels, he says, Peter takes him aside, no, forbid it, Lord. Peter says, get behind me, Satan. Don't tempt me. 
Because actually, Jesus' exercise of power was exercise of the power of self-giving in service. So in chapter 10, they still haven't got it. They're walking along the road. They're arguing about who is greatest in the kingdom. Jesus turns to them and says, and James and John just asked him for, for um, that his right and left hand in, in, in this kingdom of glory and power that he's going to be, going to be in. And Jesus says, turns to them and says, you know how it is with the rulers of the pagans, how they lord it over their subjects. In other words, in, in pagan culture, those with power exercise power over others for their own benefit, and they use the strength they have to reinforce their own primacy and position. Substitute in there whoever you know in your culture who has power. What does he say? Not so with you. The reason why Christian faith offers a, 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 a radical critique to the move from sex bodies to sex roles in society because Jesus does not accept that use of power. We're given power in order to effectively serve others. That's what power is for in the kingdom of God. So Jesus goes on, Luke 10, uh, Mark 10, 45 says, for the son of man in Daniel, the one who's going to be coming on the clouds of the ancient days, who's going to be given a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom over the nations and destroy these beasts that come from the sea. The son, this son of man came not to be served as a king, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. If you have power, God has given you that power so that you can use it to serve other people. If you're in a patriarchal culture and you're a man who has power as a man, God has given you that in order that you may serve others. Now, I'm going to say something controversial here about Ephesians chapter 5. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is talking to the community there and says... Be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another. And this has been much misinterpreted. He goes on to say, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. So what he's saying is that you may be living this new kingdom life where there is no marriage or giving a marriage, yet pat domestic patterns of family still pertain. But then he says to the husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for it. So he's using exactly the same kind of language. Now the, the people take that out of context. Interpret that to say, aha. Husbands are supposed to be like Jesus to their wives. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't say that. Because the husband isn't the saviour of the wife. And the husband is not the lord of the wife. Even though Jesus is our lord and saviour. He's picking up specifically on that theme. That Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself. Now, by the way, notice that Paul, in this destruction in Ephesians 5, he's, he speaks about three times as many words to the men as the women, which suggests that it's the men who've got the problem, because they need teaching, right? Okay. But the second thing is the context is, he's speaking to a context where the dominant view of the, of the domestic arrangements was that from Aristotle. Aristotle said, the husband rules over the wife because he is fit to do that by nature, just as a king rules over a subject people. That's the context he's speaking into. By the way, he's drawing on ancient physiognomy. Physiognomy is the art of saying you look at people's physical bodies and that tells you what they should do in life. So it's very common to say, look, men have strong, broad backs. That shows you that men should rule. Women have weak backs. That shows you that they are there to serve. And this is going to be, if those of you who are going to read through Luke's gospel this year, it's really pertinent because, because Luke is speaking that into that context. He's very alert to those physiognomical questions. So a, in Luke alone, a woman comes over, bent over, probably with um, ankylizing spondylitis, and Jesus heals her, straightens her back. Because she's bent over, people would look at her and say, her body tells us what her life is like. She's obviously a sinner or something, and Jesus heals her bodies. Isn't it interesting how often Jesus heals people's bodies? Bodily healing. Or why is it that Luke alone includes the story of Zacchaeus, who is little? Because if you were small in Greek or Roman culture, that showed you that you were an inferior kind of person. And yet here we are, Jesus pronounces to this small person, today the kingdom has come to you. So Luke is really attuned to these questions of physiognomy and the link between our bodies and our place in society. And Jesus breaks that connection. And what he's saying is he takes the Aristotelian view where husbands rule over their wives and he says... Not so with you. You are to 
Love and to serve and to give yourself up for your wives. It's almost exactly echoing that language you find in Mark 10, 45, where Jesus says, the exercise of spiritual power is shown in serving others and using your power to equip them. And that's why we have a very different connection in Christian theology between the sex body and, the, and, and, and sex society. And that's why Paul talks about in Galatians 3.28, there is no male or female. He doesn't say that males and females don't exist. He's not obliterating that creation order. What he's saying is there's no differentiation in terms of your status in, your access to salvation in the kingdom. Men and women equally have their place. Slaves and free equally have their place. Jew and Gentile equally have their place in the kingdom. Because your sex, your differentiated body doesn't determine your differentiated role. That's why we find in Paul, we find him encouraging women to pray and prophesy, encouraging them to teach. And we might go back to the problematic uh, text if you want to come back to that in questions. So in the questions. Here's a radical text. Have you ever read this? Carefully. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4. I read this out loud in a class once and I hadn't really got my head around its significance. And I had a moment of revelation in front of a theology class and I think they wondered what was going on because I got very very excited 1 Corinthians 7 4 now for the matters about which you wrote says Paul you say it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman but says Paul no sex is a good thing our sex bodies are a gift from God sex is a good activity if you're married in the right context good sex is a good thing so get on with it the husband, verse 3, should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. In first century context, this is extraordinarily radical. Okay, the, Paul is saying here, I don't want to throw up lots of pastoral issues here, but Paul is saying, if you're married, you should be having sex. And in fact, husbands are obliged to satisfy their wives sexually. I mean, it is a bit awkward, isn't it? Um... The wife, now here's interesting, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. All the patriarchs are going, yay, Paul, preach it. And then Paul says, in the same way, in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields to his wife. You could not get more symmetrical than that, and you could not get more uh, explicit in terms of the relationship between male and female authority. We talked about women and authority. Paul here is explicitly saying that women exercise authority over their husbands' bodies. I can't think of anything I've read in any text before the year 18-something which says so explicitly that men and women mutually exercise authority over each other. Can I, Elaine, do you, well, you might say in the questions come back to me. I can't. It's extraordinary. Extraordinarily anti-patriarchal. It's extraordinarily egalitarian. Now, the last two comments are, because we're to finish, um, bodies and power. I think, that, I think bec because um, of the way that uh, Scripture sees us as bodily people, then the issues around how people exercise power over other bodies is um, really important. It comes out in a number of different places, particularly in the discussion about slavery. Um, there's a really interesting, I'm a bit obsessed with this, as um, Tim suggested, Revelation is my thing. So I have poured over every single verse of Revelation very carefully. Uh, there's still lots more to discover, but there's some really interesting things we don't notice. In Revelation chapter 18, it's a scene of judgment. It's a scene of judgment over um, Babylon, which is a biblical image for the city of Rome and Roman imperial power. And there are three groups of people who've benefited. It's all to do with, again, power dynamics. So the kings of the earth have benefited from Babylon's domination of the world and exploitation of the world. And by the way, environmental degradation and exploitation as well, which the book of Revelation tackles. So the kings of the earth are the client kings of the different states, the different areas, different provinces who've benefited from, from the backup from Roman rule. There's the, the sea captains because maritime trade was a really big thing in the Roman Empire. And uh, they have massive, mar it's a fascinating study of look at ma maritime trade feeding the big massive population of Rome. And the merchants of the earth. So humans make empires. Those empires exploit the environment. Uh, they depend on international trade. And they also depend on exploiting the exploitative greed, uh, enslaving people. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you. <laughs> that sounds very much like the 21st century, doesn't it? 
Maritime trade, people being exploited. Think about people working in factories in the Far East, making your iPhone. Uh, first century, the same, plus ça change. Humanity hasn't changed. And Revelation 18 offers a massive critique to that because Babylon is judged for its exploitation, both for its killing of the saints, but also its killing and exploitation of all peoples, including slaves. So the Roman Empire depended on slave labor. And I think at one point the empire was probably something like a quarter slaves. When, when um, Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, he massacred half of them and the other half he enslaved. It was the sort of thing you just sort of did. Slavery had no connection, by the way, with sort of ethnic or identity or skin color because in the ancient world that was all configured a very different way. Um, but uh, at the end of, in, in Revelation, 20, uh, Revelation chapter 18, the merchants are condemned for the list of goods that they traded. And there's a list of 28 goods, which is symbolic because 28 is four times seven, which says four, four is the number of the world, the four points of the compass, and seven means the completeness. So it symbolizes all this trade from around the world. But the last of the 28th item is, most English translations, bodies, that is, human souls. And the word body, the word body was the normal word for a slave. In the, in the Roman Empire, you called a slave a soma, a body, because they weren't a human being, they weren't of any value, they weren't even kind of a living thing. They were treated as a tool or an instrument. So people would talk about deploying their slaves in certain ways, just as they would talk about using a hammer to bang a nail in or whatever. They were, they were just called bodies. But what Revelation does, it says, no, they're not. They are not merely bodies. It's using language from uh, um, the prophet Ezekiel. It's saying, these are human beings. These are anthropone. These are Adam. It goes right back to the creation thing. These are Adam, human beings made in the image of God. And the condemnation is an instrumentalization of human bodies. So to the extent to which, in the sort of trans ideology, people are exercising instrumental power over the bodies of others and cutting up bodies and doing things and making money out of that, then scripture is condemning them for that. And um, just next line on the slide. Another fascinating, we need to talk about this more. And uh, sadly, the history of Christian interpretation hasn't done this uh, justice. In uh, Colossians 4, verse 1, the really extraordinary thing in um, the New Testament in Paul's household instructions is not that he allows slaves and masters to coexist, but he completely dismantles the presuppositions about slavery in the ancient world. Slaves did what they were told. Paul writes to slaves. He appeals to them as moral agents because he sees all humanity as made in the image of God. Masters, he says in, in Colossians 4, often, treat your slaves with equality. The Greek word is isotes. Iso, as in isobar, iso, iso, iso means the same. Masters, treat your slaves the same way as you treat yourselves because you are all slaves of one master in heaven. The radical egalitarian way of undercutting the way that some people exercise power over the bodies of others. I think my last observation is one about language, and we might come back and explore this. If reality is determined by what's inside, not what's outside, what you're, what you're thinking and feeling, not your psycho... Oh, by the way, psychosomatics comes to that. Sorry, can we go back to that slide? That is my last slide here, this one. This is where we get the phrase psychosomatic from. Here we go. Uh, sorry, that one. That's it. Um, it's this language from Revelation 18:13. Bodies, soma, somatone. Somatone, kai, psuches, anthropone. Somatone, psuche, body, soul. Psychosomatic unity. Um, if, if reality is determined interiorly by ourselves as individuals, autonomous beings, do texts mean anything? Now, that might sound like a bit of a leap, but actually this is something that's been going on in our culture since the 1960s. So in the way that texts are treated in literary criticism, there's been this big movement which says that it is ourselves as readers on our own who determine what texts mean. Now, if you've done literary studies, you might have come across people, French literary critics like Roland Barthes or Jacques Derrida, and you may not know who they are, but believe you me, they're having a massive influence on our culture. Because what they're saying is that, that language doesn't have any meaning of its own. Language only means what the reader 
makes it mean. In other words, the same thing is going on with texts here as is going on with reality in relation to the trans ideology. So for, for, for a trans person, who I am is determined interior, on the interior by me and by how I feel, not by my body. We treat, if we treat, do the same thing with text and say, texts don't mean what the author wanted or what other people have determined, but texts only mean what I decide them to mean, then we get into all sorts of problems because it means that scripture can't make any claims on us. God can't speak to us. And this whole movement about saying it's the reader who constructs meaning, this is a big thing behind um, uh, critical theory and critical race theory. And if I just mention that, you might have come across in the discussions about Black Lives Matter and all that's happening in terms of race and so on. But this is a very big move. We might want to explore it in the questions. But when we get to the point where it's the individual on their own who determines the meaning, either of texts or of themselves in society, that's when we get into all sorts of trouble. Scripture says no. Scripture says God does speak to us. God speaks a gracious word to us. That makes claims on us which God invites us to respond to. He made us with, with body, sex bodies and that is, in his goodwill, a good gift to us. I'm going to stop there.